So again, I wanted to just thank you guys for being here today. Um, welcome to a Foster Media Connections Youth Voice Program Empowered webinar. We're going to be in, entitled Somebody's Child or Nobody's Child. We're going to be talking to live experienced youth who were placed in foster care because their parents were incarcerated. Um, this is... First of all, I want to let everyone know that this is a safe space. Um, and so we want to definitely um, create an open platform that all foster youth feel that they can come to and speak and share their experiences and hope to feel empowered and empower other people. So I just wanted to thank our panelists for being here today. Um, shout out to Sarah in the background who's helping us with all of our technical support today. Um, and welcome to our webinar. Thank you to all of our audience members. If you are joining us, um, you are in tune for a wonderful event, and I am very happy to have you all here today. And so, just a little bit about the Youth Voice program. And so the Youth Voice provides writing opportunities to young people who have lived experience in the child welfare or in juvenile justice system. We also help youth who have been, um, who have experienced homelessness as well. Um, through educational workshops, um, writing a poetry contests, paid contributor roles, intensive fellowships, our Youth Voice participants learn how to produce journalism that allows them to have more prominent roles in the public discourse that shapes policy and ultimately their lives. And so below at the bottom, you'll see our social media handles. Please, please feel free to follow us. Um, if you are interested in, in attending more events and learning more things about um, our great opportunities, please feel free um, to um, subscribe to our newsletter. Um, just a little bit about my background. I have been with the Youth Voice program for two years now, and I just actually celebrated my two-year anniversary almost a month ago. And um, since I've come into this program, just as a former foster youth, um, my goal is to create a platform that's for us, by us, um, just with genuine um, support and um, obviously, you know, just being the former foster youth as well, it just has has been so impactful because I'm able to, um, you know, meet all of our youth and our writers and our participants and our panelists, um, you know, at the, the level that they are at. And, and because I understand and I've lived all of these experiences in which we advocate for here at the Youth Voice Program. And so just to be able to, um, you know, share my experiences to create a platform um, to continue to support and promote a platform that has created a um, created a space for foster youth to come and share their experiences. I'm just happy to be a part of this program. And so again, thank you all for being in attendance today. And so at this time, you will see a lovely poll come up on your um, screen. And this is for um, just for us to know who you are, um, what agency, well, not really what agency, but you know what it is that you do, how did you hear about us? Um, and just so that we can know how we can just be better to promote and just try to get as many um, foster youth, I mean, find as many foster youth who need to share their stories so that we can shape the system. Um, it's no um, better place um, than um, it coming from a foster youth because we've lived it, we have the experiences. Um, and so um, if you guys will complete this, I would greatly appreciate it because it'll just tell us a little bit about what we're doing and how you guys found us and what we need to do better to continue to um, grow our program and find other foster youth. Thank you. And we should be sharing those poll results in a little bit. Um, we just want to allow some more people um, the space and time to, um, you know, just get through the questions. And there we have it. We have some um, foster adoptive and kinship parents. We have some foster youth in the building. Um, which I'm always happy to see. We have social workers in the building. Um, and I have an exciting and great opportunity for um, that I will be announcing at the end of this um, event. So please stick around if you're an LA County social worker. Um, we'll, we have an announcement um, and we need some social workers. Um, we have um, people who work with foster youth. And so this is really, really great. So thank you guys so, so, so very much for um, being here today um, and completing that, um, that survey for us. And so, yes, so now 
I would like to welcome our lovely panelists to the um, stage. And again, I want to um, just really stress the fact that this is a safe space. Um, we're gonna dive into some um, intense questions um, and just so that you guys can get a more understanding, we're gonna provide some tools and advice to other youth who have experiences, to advocates who work with youth who've experienced this um, in just better ways to, you know, help support foster youth with this lived experience and um, with this lived experience. And so again, I wanna stress that this is a safe space. Panelists, I'm gonna introduce you now. Um, please feel free to come and, and wave at your camera so everyone could put the picture to the face. Um, and so first up, we have Ariel who has, um, who is a student at San Francisco State University right now. Um, she has also been a panelist for one of our previous um, workshops. And so Ariel, we are grateful to have you. Ariel Cree is a former foster youth, um, a rising senior at San Francisco State, as stated before. She is a beautiful mother, um, affordable housing advocate, a foster youth advocate, and also a mental health advocate. Um, she's aspired to be a PhD candidate upon graduating and help dismantle the systematic oppression and inherit public policies such as education education, public assistance programs, and criminal in the criminal justice system. Additionally, she is working towards conducting further research on the triad of effects that poverty has on people of color and immigrants. She hopes to leave the world a better place where there will be more equity um, and inclusion for all people and fill this as, I mean, oh, uh, um, and for all people. And so, um, and she just wants to um, make sure that she is um, working um, to better support and um, to better find ways that, that um, the unethical practices that shape the foster care system um, that she can be supportive to them. So Ariel, um, if you can just wave um, again, we wanna thank you for being a panelist. It's always great to see you in the beautiful smile. And um, so thank you. Um, next up, we have Deshaun D. Ranks. Um, and it's such a pleasure to have you. Deshaun is a rapper slash spiritual advisor from Los Angeles, California. He is a musical creative um, who, is born, who was born to a teen mom who was diagnosed with bipolar um, schizophrenia and admitted to a psychiatric institution shortly thereafter and incarcerated father. He was bounced around with various family members until the state eventually stepped in and placed him in foster care system at age 13. He remained in the foster care system until he was 18 years old. By the time he reached his 30s, D ranks had been to nearly every institution within the system, including the foster care system, group homes, halfway homes, juvenile justice, I mean, juvenile halls, boot camps, county jails, and prison. Such experiences were attributed to being a troubled foster youth who felt unloved and lacked to and lacked the proper influences. He went from being sentenced to 10 years in prison at the age of 18 to being released nearly nine years in hopes of finding his place within society. As he matured, so did his understanding of his life purpose. And so, um, Deshaun, I just want to thank you so much for being here. As stated before, we started this webinar. It's always so great to have a male presence. Um, there's a lot of young males in the world, um, and we want this safe space to be open for everyone. And so just having you um, just creates and continues to open Open up that door to let other young males know that this is a great platform that they can also feel comfortable to share their experiences in a genuine and a positive way. And so thank you so much. Your um, experiences are definitely um, inspirational and, and, and inspiring. And so um, next up, um, so Ryan actually couldn't be here today. Um, um, and so we're going to actually skip her, but we want to thank Ryan for um, reaching out to us and um, committing to being a panelist. Um, something came up and so unfortunately she's not gonna be here today, but thank you, um, Ryan, and hopefully we'll have you as a panelist um, in the future. And so last but not short, not surely not least, um, we have Shauna, who is also um, a um, previous panel um, panelists and um, we've had experience of um, participating in some of our writing opportunities and she's just an awesome person so thank you so much for being here today she is a public um, speaker and advocate um, she's 19 years old from Minnesota who was placed in the foster care system the juvenile justice system and she also has experience with homelessness um, she want to help and uh, she wants to help improve the foster care system in any way that she can um, she's attended panel uh, panels conferences um, such as this one uh, um, 
events like this one, I'm sorry, uh, peaceful marches for foster youth rights. Um, and she just really tries to amplify her voice and use her talents um, with poetry and advocation to um, try to inspire other foster youth. Um, she's also a part of um, MLYLC in Minnesota where they work um, on projects over the years to help improve the system. And she loves volunteering for her community at the food shelters and working with, um, with people with disabilities. And so again, um, Ms. Fairbanks, we want to thank you again for being here today. Um, and it's always good to see you and, um, and welcome. And so thank you um, guys. And so that is it for our panelists. And so the, the moment that everyone has been waiting for. So um, I want to say that if you have any questions um, after we finish the questions that we have for the panelists, we're gonna open it up so, to some of the questions in the chat. So please feel free to um, drop all the, qu the questions that you may have in the chat for um, uh, whether it's specifically for a panelist um, or you would love and just a general answer from everyone. Um, and then also we're gonna pull some of the questions at the end for our panelists panelists to answer as well. Um, and, and also panelists, if you have, um, if you're interested, um, if you see a question in the chat that you would love to um, answer, please feel free to do so in the chat as well. And so thank you so much. I am very, very, very excited because we have some really, really awesome, um, we have some really, really great um, questions. And so, um, at this time, um, basically how I do the webinar, um, is, is that I just um, asked the question and I open it up to the floor. I want to allow this opportunity and space for all of you guys to feel free to answer every question. Um, you know, please allow time and space for other people, you know, to share their experience. But this is your platform. This is your lived experience. No one can tell you better than you, you can tell yourself. And so um, I want to just make sure that I put that out there that you, you guys are open. Um, you know, you don't feel you don't have to feel like that you have to share everything. Um, this is definitely a sensitive and safe space. And so I just wanted to have that sidebar, um, just that sidebar before we get started. And so at this time, I would just like everyone um, and feel free, you, um, I can call on you guys or you guys can just jump on and unmute yourself. Um, I would like for you guys to share a little bit about your background um, and how um, your how did you transition into foster care? And we can start with you, Deshaun. Unmute. Grand rising, everyone. So my name is Deshaun Rankins. I go by D-Ranks, um, as stated earlier. Um, in terms of being transitioned into foster care, well, my mom was 16 years old when she had me. And she was already, by the age of 13, she was diagnosed with bipolar schizophrenia. So she was in and out of mental institutions ever since she was a little girl. And the first time she went to a mental institution after I was born, I was three days old. And I was pretty much bounced around from family member to family member. There was really no stable home, no stable situation for me um, all throughout like the greater part of my youth. By the time I was about seven years old, I probably lived with every auntie, great auntie, uncle, and so on and so forth until everybody just kind of washed their hands. They was tired of bouncing me around. Um, and I feel like there's an aspect of money involved people are not getting paid to you know have an extra how extra mouth in a house and so on and so forth even if it is family and I ended up in the foster care system um around the time like it was probably like three days or four days after my 13th birthday um but before that I was still bounced around through like every single family member that I know so it was kind of like I was the black sheep even now in my adulthood like every family member swears up and down that they love me and they miss me is because everyone has a set of experience or memory from me and my childhood just because my mom was so unstable and my dad was pretty much absent because of his incarceration. My mom was 16 and my father was 43. So he ended up going to jail for having sexual relations with a minor. So for the first nine years of my life, uh, he was incarcerated. And even after he went to jail and came home, he had made a choice to not be around me or my mom. So 
at the end of the day, the system, um, my family kind of washed their hands with the situation and the system got involved. And I stayed into the foster system well until, I want to say, I, cause I was emancipated, um, emancipated. I was in that ILP independent living program and they keep you until you're 25. But when I was 18, I went out to San Dimas into an independent living program. Um, and I just wanted to get out. I still felt that there was a level of being trapped. I still felt that there was a level of rules you had to follow and I'm supposed to be 18. I should be able to do what I want. So I ended up leaving there. And shortly after that, I ended up getting into some legal trouble and ended up going to jail. But did I answer the question correctly? <laughs> okay, just making sure. <laughs> I'm just over here nodding because we share similar experiences. And so um, it's really, really, re really great to have you. I know we I've sent emails back and forth to us sometimes, but just like seeing you first to face, face to face, um, and just hearing some um, of your story, which we're going to dive into a little bit more. Um, you know, I'm just really, really grateful to have you. And so thank you so much for giving us a brief background. And we're going to dive into some more um, in just shortly. Um, and I, so I want to welcome on Shauna to answer the same question. And then so, so Shauna, can you? You just offer a little bit about your back share a little bit about your background and how was your how was your transition into um, foster care what was that like for you okay um I went into foster care when I was eight years old um we had actually traveled the states we had um well, it wasn't really a travel it was a fleeing um my mom had gotten in both my parents actually my mom and my dad had gotten in trouble with the law um, so we left Minnesota and we lived in the South for a while, but, um, one day it was just me and my mom and my little sister, she wanted to come back to Minnesota. So we went back to Minnesota. I was eight years old and we were there for two months. We went back to our reservation. Um, I'm Native American. Um, and when I was eight years old, the cops had gotten called. We were homeless when we had gotten back to Minnesota, we were jump in from house to house. My mom had gotten in a fight with her boyfriend up there and they called the cops. And my my mom was gonna lie about who she was, but her boyfriend had said, oh, this is my girlfriend, blah, blah, blah. And so she got in trouble and she got arrested. And I was eight and my little sister was six. Um, the police didn't take us away quite yet. We um, actually were knocking on door to door asking could, can we stay with you not knowing like whose door we weren't really taught stranger danger you know we were just knocking on every door and one one door I was a friend from school and she let us stay with her for a couple weeks and I guess her mom called someone and um social worker came to get us I, I was like I was scared because I didn't know who this woman was and she's taking me and my little sister um we ended up getting placed with a relative so one of my relatives was licensed. Um, it was my great aunt. Um, we stayed with her for four years while my mom was in prison. Um, it was a very tough time for me because I just I just wanted my mom, and I didn't know where my mom was. I was like, I was like, where is my mom? She just I saw her and she just disappeared. I probably would have been in foster care at four if we hadn't fled the state. Um, and then when I was 12, she got us back when she was at a substance use treatment um, place. And then um, eight months later, we went on a home visit to my grandma's and she had relapsed. And so we were homeless for a couple months. And then down the line, it was December 2015, I was 13 years old and we were placed in foster care again. So that was really tough because it was just like constantly seeing my mom getting in trouble with the law. I just, I just wanted my mom. I was never mad at her. I just really <laughs> needed her there, you know. I, I, I hear you. I hear you. And despite all of the things that you went through, you still were able to come out on top. And so, even though you know, the dark cloud was there at, at times, and I always say like, you know, I used to be in the rooms like, why me, God? Like, why, why, why me? Like, you know, but working here at Foster Media Connections and then, you know, being able to like, you know, really work with foster youth and like use my experience. Like I know now 
you know, that was why. And so, um, you know, rather whatever it is that you're doing in your daily activities or just in your life, short, long-term goals, you know, just know that, you know, just with the, this special experience that we all share, you're going to be able to reach back. And even if you only touch one person, you know, you did, um, you know, something, some justice. And so thank you so much again for being here. And so last but surely not least, um, Ariel, I would love for you to answer the same question. Do you need me to repeat it? Uh, no, I have the question. How was my transition into foster care? Um, so my transition was like just really traumatic. Um, I was placed at 14. Um, my mom attacked me in front of an elderly woman and she called the police. But the whole me getting to foster care was such like a, um, like me getting there was such a journey because my mom had a lot of like reports against her, but like no one just like investigated it. Um, but a lot of it really um, just stemmed lot from lot just my mom um, and my dad because my dad, he was in and out of jail since 18 and like, he, you know, he pulled the okie doke on my mom. Like my mom was raised by a single parent that had mental health issues and she was just alone in the world. And, you know, my dad made it seem like he cared about her and he just got her in a situation where, you know, she has a baby. She didn't have like the money or the resources to take care of it. And it really deteriorated her mental health, which caused her to be violent towards me. And then the culmination of her just becoming more violent as I got older. So at 14, um, I was placed in a foster care. At that time, my dad was like incarcerated as well. Um, so it was like so weird, like just, you know, going to court and like they have like a lawyer for him. And like, he's like, oh, like I want such and such like because he wanted me to get placed with my half sister because I have a lot of half siblings um but it was just like it was definitely like just traumatic because you just feel like um you know you feel let down by your mom but you also feel let down by your dad because your dad kind of created the situation um created the situation by putting her in such um, a position. And it was like, um, you know, it was just like a lot of feelings of just like, just feeling lost. You're just like, how did I end up here? Like, this is not the place that I'm used to. And just dealing with, um, you know, dealing with social workers that just like, you're just like another number to them. And like, they're not explaining like, okay, this is how you set up. Um, there's like a way well, you can communicate with people in prison, but like, they're like, they're just like, they just send you the link and they're not like hoping you or like explaining things that are like going on. So uh, that was my introduction into foster care. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ariel. You know, I always just love having you as a panelist because I just feel like that it is just a different experience every time. And so thank you so much for sharing your experience. I really appreciate it. And we're going to keep, um, you know, diving into that. At this time, though, I do want to welcome our last panelist. Ryan has finally joined us and we want to give you a warm welcome, Ryan. Thank you so much for being here. Ryan is a currently... Um, living where where are you located right now ryan where did you say i know you're in a different country right now wait maybe she's are you are you oh you you have to unmute yourself look it's muted <laughs> no worries no worries no, I, i'm I, so I, smart i swear oh, okay. <laughs> where do you were now ryan where, where are you um located at right now um i'm from north carolina Yes. Um, I am currently in Panama for another week. Um, yeah. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Ryan, for being here. Um, you came right on time because we were just answering the first question. And so I was asking our panelists um, to share a little bit about their background um, and how did they transition into foster care? Um, okay. Well, born in Charlotte. 
Um, I was raised by my grandma in Garner, um, Kuwait, um, with, with um, my paternal side of the family until another age. And then I think it was around 11, I went into foster care. And then I came out and was back with family and then well, went back in again at like 14. And then uh, I aged out. Um, that's my foster care blip. Um, my mother was incarcerated um, when I was two. Um, my father or my father figure at the time was also incarcerated. Um, yeah, at this point, um, I mean, throughout my mother's incarceration and throughout my time in foster, foster care, um, I can say that I don't know how universal this experience is, but I can say that um, my very first like advocate for me was my mom. Like she did despite our circumstances, she did all she could. Um, she came to court date, she did all this stuff. Um, but also coming to the understanding that as I've grown outside of the foster care, the perception of me from all of the people at that time, like for one, it was a, it was a child. Um, still on some levels, I still am a child. And also like a child living in survival mode. So like, of course, living the repercussions of my parents' actions, it's not easy for anyone, let alone in a child who's orphaned and made to seem as if, as if they're everyone else's problem. But um, growing into like learning who I am as a person and like learning to like to re tap into like who I was before all of the mess, you know. Um, I feel like that's had a significant impact on how I perceive that part of my life now, you know? So. Most certainly, most certainly. And it is universal. Um, it's crazy because you meet a lot of foster. I mean, I come across a lot of foster youth and the ones that I come across, um, it, despite some of those, you know, 1%, 2% that had good experiences, um, it seems no matter where we were at, North, North Carolina, Chicago, Minnesota, Los Angeles, we all kind of still, it still was traumatic for us. And my goal is to figure out and to have conversations from youth who've actually experienced it. And so that we can figure out better ways to, you know, try to help others um, combat those feelings and cope with, um, you know, being a foster youth because it is traumatic and it's a lot that we deal with. And so transitioning and saying into the next question um, that I have for you all. And thank you, um, Ryan, for that um, beautiful introduction. Um, and we're very happy to have you. Um, as a former foster youth with parents who were incarcerated, what was the significant memory that you have um, during that time period in your life? And what um, and why what, did that core memory stay with you? And um, I will um, kick it off with Ariel. I think the most um I think the most significant thing is I remember being in one of my foster homes and I was just like emailing my dad who was incarcerated and um like he was like he was like promising to like help me like you know, I wanted to take like an after school class, something I was in high school, but I wanted to take like an after school class. And he was like promising to like pay for, and he was just like over promising things that he just couldn't do. And it was just really, just really sad to me. And just a sad realization because like my mom was not the mom that I needed her to be. And I was, you know, I was a young kid. I just wanted to feel loved, but like, I was like, I was just like, what I guess wanted was like mm -hmm. someone to keep it real with me. And it was really hard to have like my dad like lying saying he's gonna do all these things for me that he just couldn't do. And like, I don't know why he would do those, tell me the things that he couldn't do. And it was just, it was just so like, disappointing and you just like it's just hard because you internalize it because you feel like is it me like am I doing something wrong because why do I have these parents that, that like just hurt me and it's just like and you just feel so lonely 
um, because it didn't just stop with like my parents not being the best parents. Like I didn't have the best grandparents. It just feels like, you're like, what did I step into? Kind of similar to what you said of like, why me? <laughs> like, why do I have to take this journey going through just going through all of that? So that was kind of like, like a big realization for me because I always just fantasized about my dad saving me for my mom and he couldn't and he was just as bad but in just different ways so just like that realization and if you were at the great Gatsby, but it was kind of about the 20th century and like the roaringness of it like everyone's getting rich really quickly but like it's all kind of like uh you realize that like the truth of it. it is not as glamorous as it seems and that was what happened to me um so yeah <laughs> thank you thank you thank you so much for um sharing your love and perspective and experience I really really appreciate it I just really love hearing you talk like I can listen to you talk you know, all day like no lie but um I want to give um our other panelists um time to answer that question if you would like to um you can unmute yourself or I can just call on you so Shauna um would you like to answer that same question please would you like for me to repeat um the question was like the, um something about a memory sticking with you through yeah so um as a former foster youth whose parents were incarcerated, what was the most significant memory that you have during that time period of your life? And why did that core memory stick with you? Um, well, my mom altogether was incarcerated for four years. There was a break in between there when I was 10 and my little sister was eight. Um, this was the time my mom had gotten arrested again um, this memory really sticks with me, like, it just pops out. We had lived in these townhomes. Um, my mom, me and my little sister were in the house. I remember we had this box from the food shelf, and my mom was getting arrested again. We could see her outside the window, and, like, I was terrified because I was like, oh, my God. I'm like, where am I going to go? Um, the police didn't think to check in the house, and... My younger sister and I, we were in there for two weeks before anyone came to get us. Um, we, we mostly just ate peanut butter jelly sandwiches and like milk. Um, I think that really stands out to me like the most because now that I'm like, now that it's 10 years later, I, I think, wow, I was really 10 years old and in a house alone for two weeks with my younger sister. I'm like, I don't know back then I really thought stuff was like that was normal like that was my day-to-day -day life and looking back now I feel I feel bad about it but I think that's something that really sticks out to me yeah thank you thank you so much um Ryan you can feel free to hop on whenever you're ready um, I don't have <laughs> a specific memory um, from that time period, because it was all just trauma and drama. Um, like, it all affected me pretty much down the same pathway, right? Um, but I can say, like, a lesson, like, not a lesson, but, like, a beacon of hope, I guess, for myself, is that, like, from that time period, is that, like, no matter what the things that were going on, um, Everything that I wanted, I always got, not like physically, but like going to the school, like I advocated for myself always. Like even when there were people asking me, I don't think that's possible or how do you think that's gonna get done? I didn't know either, but I was still like, be damned if it doesn't happen because I wanted to, you know, kind of thing. And so, yeah, that's like one of my, I don't wanna say core memories, but it's like something I still hold with me from that time period that I learned. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you were so right. Trauma and drama, Lord Jesus. And it's crazy how a lot of us have experiences of blocking out some of those. I'm actually working on a book and I didn't even realize how much I had like, you know, like shoved to the back of my head because it was like, I didn't have time to think about um, like my emotions. And, and like, even as a mom now, I find myself having to like dial back and be soft because it's like, 
you know, I, I didn't get the, the chance to cry. And even when I had the chance to cry, it was like, oh, you only can cry for a couple of times. And then you got to just like get get back into, you know, survivor mode and get back, get back right, you know. And so um, I really appreciate you sharing that perspective because I definitely relate. Um, and so um, last but surely not least, um, D-Ranks, please feel free to chime in um, with your experience. Um, okay, first I want to say, Sana, you don't have nothing to feel bad about. You know, I know you, you had mentioned that you felt bad about, you know, the way you had grew up and you thought it was normal. For a lot of us, like we all thought it was normal until you get exposed to other people that's doing something different. And the majority of people like in your school and stuff, they all doing something different. And you're like, oh, shit, this isn't normal. Oh, excuse my language. It's like, oh, snap, this is not normal. But like for me, um, as I previously stated, I was bounced around from every single, like every single family member from like the age of three. But a, a couple of my core memories come from, um, from like, I, did I say the age three? I meant to say three days old. So like my grandpa, well, who I call grandpa, he was more like a great uncle. But he was like old, like a grandpa. So I used to always call him grandpa or bubba. Um, for like the first seven years of my life, he did everything in his power to create what we would call a normal um, upbringing for me. He did everything in his power, you know, like he spoiled me, you know, so much to the point where other family members were kind of like jealous of the attention and stuff. And I never understood why, you know, I got so much attention. Um, and then he ended up passing away. And he passed away suddenly and traumatically. And it seemed like my world kind of shifted from then because um, my mom had came back into my life because she had um, met a guy. She got like heavy into the church and she met a guy who was heavy into the church and he was from the South. And I'm from Los Angeles, born and raised. So he was from the South and he kind of had this thing about um, all your family, all your kids should be under one roof. And she has eight kids. So, you know, she kind of went around and got the rest of her kids. And she took me from my school. And I remember them calling me over the speaker. I went to 24th Street Elementary School. And I remember them calling me over the speaker. Like, and it was like, I was in school. I probably was like fourth grade or something like that. Probably third. I don't really recall the exact grade. But I remember them saying my name, Deshaun Rankins come to the main office and I was like oh yeah we about to get up out of here and I grabbed my stuff and I just took off running like full throttle I thought it was like my grandpa coming to pick me up early from school when I got there it was my mom now I knew who she was because it wasn't like she was a stranger she was just always kind of like in and out and when she got there I was kind of like standoffish like what is this so she like, uh, we about to take you home. And she was standing there with her, with her new husband. They had just got married. I had never met this person. And they're like, oh, we're going to take you home. And I was like, oh, okay. So I just happily go lucky. I get in the car and instead of me going left to where my grandpa lived, because I was staying with my grandpa or my great, great uncle, we made a right. And when we made that right, it seemed like the further we got away, the more anxiety I started to feel. I started to get like, I started to get sad. I was, I was crying. I was like, kidnapped, help, help. Like, what are you guys doing? And probably like a week after that, he ended up having a heart attack and he ended up passing away. He was really fighting to get me back. And, you know, my aunties, they kind of say that it was a, a heavy heart for him that kind of messed him up mentally and it really kind of took him under um after I ended up and every time her husband kind of went to jail like she would let me go to another another family member like she was like go oh, get up out of here like it was kind of weird like she was only having all of us under one roof when he was there but when he ended up getting in trouble and going to jail she kind of like told us to go back to wherever we was at and um, ultimately they ended up having a divorce and going through their whole little spat. He ended up going to jail for murder and he ended up getting a life sentence behind it. So she ended up 
you know, letting us ultimately get taken by the foster people. And by this time, you know, there was the back and forth thing with my family. It had been going on probably for about five or six years because I was seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So six years, 13. I went to the foster system and this part really kind of like, like it really messed me up so much. I didn't even realize until I got older and started to do a lot of inner healing and spiritual work and just shadow work to see what was the fall um, mentally with me. All the children got taken, but when we went back to court, like after the after the first court date, so it would be the second court date, she asked for one of the children, like asked for all her children back. Like she fought to get all her children back, but she told them that she didn't want me. And they really like messed me up. Even though like, I didn't even like being over there. I did not like going over there with my mom, but to feel unwanted, like it really kind of threw me off. Like I did not understand like why my own mom didn't want me. But there was like a lot of different things that was transpiring like that. Like my aunt was told me because my mom was really abusive. So she would tell me like, just tell your mom that you love her. You know, every time she yells at you or hits you, just tell her she love you, love her, you love her, you love her. And she'll she'll leave you alone and she should it should work. So and this is her sister. So I remember one day she was getting on me, just whooping me, beating me. Crucial. And then I was screaming, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. And then she was like, shut the hell up. Why do you keep saying that? I don't even love you. I don't even know you. And it like, these things are things that I really had to chip away at in like therapy sessions and stuff. And two, like everybody that's, that like we have an advantage too, being foster children, foster former foster youth and all of that. Like we get therapy, like the average kid does not get that like take advantage of it if you get it I know like it's for me it took a lot for me to open up to an actual therapist but like it's it, it really helps but she was like I don't love you stop freaking saying that and then when I finally ended up like just getting indefinitely going to the foster system um I was still trying to communicate I had access to the the courts they would give me her phone number like anytime I would write the courts they would give me her phone number so I had wrote them because I knew her birthday and I called her on her birthday from, you know, my new foster home. And this is my first time speaking to her in about maybe like 18 months, could have been like two years, couldn't have been more than that. And she picked up the phone and it sounded like she was having a great time. And I was like, happy birthday to you. And she was like, who is this? And I was like, it's your oldest son. And she was like, how the hell you keep getting my number click and when I tell you like it hurt me so bad that I took pills I took pills and I tried to kill myself even though I didn't even like living with my mom just the level of not being wanted from the person I gave birth to you it really messed me up and I was like probably 14, couldn't have been no more than 15 at the time. It really messed me up to not be wanted. And at school, I was popular. All the girls thought I was cute. Like I had hella friends and all of that, but I did not feel like I had a home. And my own mom was constantly telling me that she didn't want me. And I was bouncing around from foster home to foster home. It wasn't no different from family member to family member. Like I literally got to the point where I was living out of a duffel bag I would go to a new foster home. I wouldn't even unpack. Like they would tell me like, oh, you can get comfortable. And I'd be like, yeah, I'm, I'm good. Like at a young age, cause I was already doing that with all my family members. So I didn't even unpack. And even later when I went to prison, I would go to a cell. I wouldn't even decorate the cell. People would put pictures of their kids and family on the wall. Like I didn't even do that. I was like, oh, I'm, I'm good. Like I'm, I may end up going to another cell anyway. I end up going somewhere else. But it was like those type of memories that really like, had messed me up greatly and to the point where it was like you like like yo you need therapy like for real for real because I started to see things like patterns in adulthood even you know getting in relationships with women and so on and so forth like there was real patterns and I had to kind of like put peel back the layers like an onion 
to really figure out what it was. And it was like so those type of core situations that really made a great difference in my, in my, in my life and my upbringing and my outlook on life. Yeah, that that really touched my soul. And thank you so much for just being open to share it. Um, your experience, I know, just as, uh, you know, a young black male, you know, in our home with my brothers, you know, you can't cry, especially if you're a boy. And, you know, just to hear like, you know, the emotion in your voice um, as you share your experience um, that like just speaks home to me because, you know, I, I, I share the similar experience. I, I definitely um, you know, feel like we all know what it feels like to be abandoned. But, um, you know, to hear some of the things that your mom, um, you know, told uh, told you or said to you, um, and, you know, just to think of some of the things and the memories that I had, like, you know, in my head of some of the things that my mom's, you know, said to me that made me feel unwanted, you know, living out of duffel bag, not going to placements, um, you know, and unpacking your clothes, like that actually being unorthodox to you, like, you know what I'm saying? Because that wasn't what, you know, and it's so unfortunate. Um, it's very unfortunate, um, but that's exactly why we have, you know, these platforms like this so that not only you can get this out, but that somebody is watching this, um, you know, and they're going to see you that you look like them or that you had the same experience as them or you came from the same place as them, whatever is the connection that they can identify and make with you outside of just being a foster youth. Um, I'm, your story is definitely valuable. And I hope that um, you continue to, and all of you guys could continue to, um, you know, just keep utilizing your voices and, you know, talking about the different patterns and the different signs and the different traumatic experiences you had and how it helps shape your perspective perception and even now and as an adult um and you know living well or you know doing better than our you know what we our experiences were when we were children um and you know having to unpeel those layers and unlearn those habits and um un you know suppress those thoughts um you know is it, it, is definitely traumatic and so thank you very very much um for sharing your experience and so um i want to dive in um into um our next question and and i want to to low-key it be a two-part question because I kind of feel like that you guys have shared what your foster care experience was like um uh, briefly um and so um what give a brief a uh, synopsis you know if you can define your foster youth experience your foster care experience in one word um what would it be and why um and we'll um start with you um Shana um I, I really don't know like a specific word. Um, it felt like it went really fast, but really slow at the same time. I don't, I don't know the word for that, but um, yeah. I felt like that because like all these things were happening to me and at times it would feel really painstakingly slow but other times it would be it would be like you know three to five years down the road and I'd be like wow that was such a long time ago but it's still going by slow but fast and I don't know the right word for that but I don't know if that's how it felt yeah maybe it isn't a right word maybe one word doesn't define what your experience it is, what your experience is and I definitely don't want to you so thank you um and so if any of you guys want to come on outside of, um, in addition to sharing your foster care experience, like one word that would define that and why, um, I would like for you guys to also say again to um, whether you were mistreated by your caregivers or your social workers, um, or, or if you felt judged by the people who were supposed to be advocating for you um, due to your family circumstances or your, um, you know, your parents being incarcerated. Personally, I can say it was um, it was life changing. It was life saving at the same time, because coming from Los Angeles, like it's it's kind of like a, a great possibility that you can get pulled into gang culture, especially being a young black man. It's like you 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 can feel a lot of pressure in society. The foster system it kind of took me away from the inner city. I was in um, different foster homes in the valley. So I didn't deal with a lot of different um, pressures that a lot of my peers did. Um, 
and there was a level of of also um like in, for, for, a foster home was the first place that I had my own bed and my own room like I didn't have that it's like even though I may have had some horrible foster parents I, I had a lot of them you know but I had more good ones than bad ones it was just that the bad ones didn't allow me to appreciate the good ones like I was having guards and stuff up. So I can't like rag on the foster system because I feel like it really changed me. Like sometimes I communicate with my brothers and sisters today. I talk to them as adults and they really messed up. And I'd be over here like, damn, it's because they didn't have the type of outlets and stuff that was afforded to me being a foster youth. Like they like really like got kind of slung through the mud, just kind of living with my mom and stuff like that and growing up with her instabilities and her mental instabilities. So for me, it was life-saving and, and life-changing. I had some bad um, social workers. You know, that's why that's how the, the juvenile hall thing ended up coming about because of the, the social workers just didn't want to kind of like put the extra effort in and find me a, a good foster home, so on and so forth. Cause so they kind of put you in juvenile hall and they put these holds on you and stuff like that but like the foster system in a nutshell it really helped me if I would have really did what I was supposed to do like I really could have been able to really take advantage of some things like the independent living program I did not take advantage of that I wish I would have but I did not like I was like man I'm done with this and was back living on a family member couch like why would you do that like they gave you a whole house like I just I feel like it was definitely life-saving and life-changing personally I love that. I love that. Um, Ariel or Ryan, you can feel free to hop on um, and chime in if you would like. Yeah, um, I'll go. My experience was just disappointment. It was, it was just, it was just horrible. Like I was really like, sitting here and you asked the question, like, I'll never forget like the first home that I was like placed in, which was supposed to be like a good home, right? This, like this this girl like she she lived in the city that was okay but she was like the nicer neighborhood but like you know you started living there and like I just never forget she had like a dog and the dog peed right in front of our bathroom and we had to share the bathroom with her daycare kids so there was heck of people toddlers in and out of our bathroom and like we had to share that same bathroom but I never forget like her dog peed in front of the door of the bathroom and she made me clean it up I was like <laughs> I was like this is your dog you let your dog walk around you let him pee and you expect me and my foster sister who was pregnant at the time having to clean it up but for me it was just disappointment at the three of the homes that I were in they were just doing it for the money or they were living off the checks and that's just a whole different experience because like they want to be cheap with you because the checks aren't that much just they don't pay that much especially with teens you don't get that much so they're trying to be as cheap as possible so they don't want to provide you like food they don't want to provide you like you're supposed to like you have rights they give you a pamphlet and they tell you these are your rights you deserve food and water access to your family etc cetera, etc cetera. but like as I started actually getting in these homes and like being in these homes you realize that that's not true they want you to shut up and just to take whatever treatment that you're getting because they have such a huge caseload because what end up happening is I went through four homes in nine months. I told you three of the homes were just, they weren't providing basic necessities. One didn't want to provide deodorant. The other one didn't want to provide lotion. Um, the other one didn't want to provide like fruits and vegetables. She only wanted to give us frozen food. And then one woman was just mentally unstable. She was a weirdo. Uh, <laughs> so like for me, like I just wanted to go home. I was like, I'd rather deal with like my mom and her being emotionally unstable and deal with that then actually have to continue to advocate for myself. And the cherry on the top is my mom told me after this all happened, they were trying to put me on medication because I was talking out about the injustices that I was facing within my foster homes. And I could not believe that they 
they literally asked my mom, they're like, can we give her medication? Mind you, I've never had any issues, but they were trying to drug me (laughs) to try to stop me from talking out about these women that were living off these checks. Like it was just, it's just horrible. So sometimes when I see like Together We Rise post pictures of teacher adopts, student from foster care I get real salty I'm not gonna lie I'm still with therapy healing all that stuff but it was just like it was just like an awful experience and I like and I just like my heart is heavy because more like my heart is heavy because like it's so easy for foster used to get lost because I remember walking home in the middle of the night and a pimp tried to approach me it was just like it's just so easy for foster youth to get lost and that these are the most vulnerable kids and they're just out here getting devoured by wolves because no one is caring so that's been my experience so disappointment was the word that came up to mind when you had that question I I really 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 appreciate your perspective um and to hear oh lord I wish I can say that I lived in three foster homes think like I wish I could say that um and it's just crazy to to know that you know you had three foster homes I lived in 33 placements and that's not even including the group homes and the residential placements that they try to put you in you know and just to just you know know that it's just so much gaslighting um you know when it comes to like foster youth our experiences and and that's why I just like want as many foster youth I, I just try to touch as many foster youth as possible because the best stories is really going to come from us the best experiences is going to come from us Uh, when I was emancipating out the system what I was finding and how you say you um, and how Ryan says she advocate for herself and spoke up that I was very outspoken as you guys can probably already tell Um, and I definitely used to be speaking up about myself um, you know and you know just trying to you know build out the resources and it's just heck of crazy to hear like you know about like you know when you tell your social workers about about what's happening in your home, um, you know, instead of them fixing the problem, um, they AWOL you or they remove you from the home seven day notice you and send you to a new placement. And it's like, this doesn't do nothing but like brush the stuff up under the rug. And what, what I hate is, is that there's a lot of people in this world, in this community that's profiting one, and that could be because they're employed with agencies or, you know, with com- communities and partnerships that work and organizations that work with foster youth. Um, they are foster parents, adoptive parents, whatever. Um, they profit off of um, foster youth. Um, but it it's not it, it, it's not being led by foster youth. You know, if you don't have the experiences, you can't tell me how to feel. You can't tell me how my traumatic experiences affected me. And it's crazy to hear you prescribe, um, them, you talk about, you know, how they prescribed you medicine. Like they used to actually force us to eat medicine when we were in group homes. And I, I like cannot swallow pills till this day. I have to chew my pills down because um, I just have anxiety because I used to like let the pills sit in my throat. And then when I used to go in my room, I used to just go in my throat and pull it out like it used to be crazy but you know it's just like you know just to just know like you know it's just so traumatic like it's just so traumatic and just to hear you guys the stories and the things that you guys went through um and just to know that we we are not we are all not too far off um but you know that's exactly why these type of platforms are available for you guys and so I'm just you know just you know great in grace right now um and in awe because um it's definitely inspiring um and you got to inspire to aspire before you expire and so ryan i'll pass that same um i'll actually transition into the next question um that i had so were you, how was your relationship with social workers and your foster parents um did you feel like that they judged you because um you know your parents were incarcerated um, a lot of things that I heard because my mom was a teen mom that I was going to be a teen mom. I actually didn't have my first child until I was 30 and it's not happening again. Praise the Lord. That birth birth and labor is no joke. Um, but 
um, you know, is an experience that I feared, um, you know, because of the things that I was told as a youth. And so I want to ask you guys the same question um, and I'll kick it off with you, Ryan. How was your relationship with your foster parents um, and your social workers um, and the people who were advocating for you around you? Um, did you feel like that, um, that they judged you because of your um, circumstances? Um, and how did that make you feel? Um, first, my relationship with my social workers and my foster parents, um, just like in foster care, um, I had a lot of social workers, um, but I was born bred a people pleaser, um, a service girl. So, um, I was a yes man to authority, um, minus when it came to like interfering with what I thought was the right way to go. Um, but like, I, I was a yes man. So I got on pretty much. Well, I was a yes man that to my foster parents. So for the most part, I got along, um, but I was a liar and I stole because if I didn't get what I want, I would find a way to get it. Um, and though that's not necessarily the right way to go, um, by, besides that regard, um, all of my mentors and all the people of authority were like, oh, you're so mature because of the experience that I had. And because I'm very introspective, like I write a lot and I like think about what's going on in here so that I, I know how to communicate it with other people. And they, they ate that up. They loved it. It was, a, it was a show. Um, because of course I was still a child again, and still in some aspects, I still am a child. And so like to have a child be able to articulate their needs and their desires and, and what would make them more comfortable so eloquently. And so wow, you're going to be so great. Um, and of course it led to like me trying to do it in school and, and of course we into that because it was all a show. Um, I think that answers the first question though. Um, can you give me the second part of the question? Started ramping. Yeah, so the first question was about, um, you know, the word that, you know, kind of describes your foster care experience. And then the second question was related to your relationship with your social oh. work foster parents and the people around you and whether they made you feel whether they judged you or made you feel insecure about your um, circumstances okay so I, I skipped the first question apparently but the second part is the second question um no one ever made me feel insecure well no one in the foster system made me feel insecure about my parents being incarcerated and I think it was due in part to the fact that my mom was again so heavily involved in all the avenues that she could be, she was always like, she was in prison, but like we had contact with her social worker, her therapist, her like certain guards at certain hours. Like we had like the court system, my court system in North Carolina um, and like just everybody, everyone was so involved, so intricately involved in my mother's story and in my story that it was less of a pity thing and more of a like, oh, you and your mother are some powerful beasts. Like y'all really are out here doing what you want and we commend you for it. Um, so like no one ever gave me mess about it because it was just like, well, y'all are doing your damn thing. Like despite all of the circumstances, you're doing really good. Word that <laughs> describes my foster care experience, um, perspective, because um, the foster care experience within itself is its own perspective but when you transition to so many places you have no choice but to recognize the ways um, other communities function how they're different from your own you have no choice but to recognize how some adults function though they may not be um, the most logical you begin to understand why because you've seen you know from another side so in the foster care experience perspective is like a really that's the root word for me I, I was mumbling, but I meant to say, I love that. I love, I love that perspective is great, a, a great perspective <laughs> um, to have. Um, and so thank you, thank you so much. And so um, we are coming down um, short on time, but I began, I definitely wanna make sure that we open up the floor 
for some of our um, panelists to be able to answer our audience questions. And so I'm going to allow two more questions um, and because I think they're very important. Um, and so the first um, question that I have um, is, and well, the second to last question that I have is in terms of trauma, which is something that's so prevalent with our experiences and the things that we have been through, how are you now as an adult, um, not only using your experiences to advocate for other foster youth, but um, to break those generational curses? And um, Ariel, you can uh, kick us off with your answer and then everyone who's interested in um, you know, answering um, can chime in afterwards. Um, I think um, that is um, a great question. I think the number one way that um, I'm showing up for myself and healing my trauma is just being present and not stuffing those feelings and realizing that like advocating for help, advocating for therapy, you know, and just like, for me, it's just like, as well as just holding space for me, holding space mm -hmm. has been really, um, has been really helpful like I'm currently I'm in weekly therapy but kind of like D ring said like that's one of the great things about being in foster care is that you are given like you are you are giving individual therapy you're giving group therapy and you can really have it as long as you want um so I think like that was really helpful so I started kind of like on this healing journey at 14 how I was placed in foster care but I don't know I just have like an innate just I don't know I just feel like I just came into this world of just like I'm not going to let whatever was passed down to me generationally continue to happen and just stand in my strength of who I am as a person and know that by me healing these traumas and not letting it become a pattern um is instrumental for me because that's how I show up for myself but it's instrumental for me to stop the generational curse that's been in my family um so I just I just hold space I just hold space and I just keep um healing and not going with the status quo kind of pulling from what D ring said it's all about just like shadow work it's all about just I be researching I like I go in like hashtags on Instagram and I'm like, like attachment theories or like, am I like, cause for me, like I had a issue of like attracting emotionally unavailable people. Cause both of my parents were emotionally unavailable. So I was creating trauma bonds with people and creating friendships and relationships and families based off that. So it was like, I don't want to continue to do that. and. I don't know what to say about like why I was like that. I'm just a person where I'm just like, I'm not doing it. I'm not continuing this and I'm not going to become like bitter and just like insulated in victimhood because that's the biggest thing is that a lot of people kind of live in victimhood and I just refuse to. That's a very lonely and disempowering place to be in and I don't want to engage in anything that is not empowering to me. So I show up, it's hard as hell. It's so hard, uh, especially like when I had to like stop like engaging in like risky sexual behavior because that's how my trauma came out is in risky sexual behavior. And it was so hard to be like, I'm not gonna do this anymore. I'm going to heal. I'm going to do the work, you know, kind of like I really, um, I really, glad that you have this family because I really um am attached to D-Ranks when he was talking about just feeling unwanted by our moms and just how hard that is and having to heal from that so I want to give time for other panelists but I feel that I'm a, other panelists I feel you D-Ranks about your mom and feeling just unworthy and how that shows up in different facets of your life <laughs> Thank you. Um, personally, in terms of like dealing with, and thank you, thank you as well, Ariel. Um, and just in terms of like dealing with trauma, um, for me, it's always been, it's kind of like um, what Ryan was saying, 
like there's a level of writing it's very therapeutic like you can't talk to nobody like I knew like I can talk to my journal and I love music music is very therapeutic so for me it's always been a level of writing even before I would be open enough to talk to a therapist or counselor I was writing I would always write and even still to this day that's that's why I make music the music it, it's it's um it's a portion of my life. It's a portion of myself. It's therapeutic. There's a lot of um, pain involved and also, you know, knowledge from, you know, life circumstances, things that I've been through that, you know, I try to overcome. I continue to overcome. But for me personally, it's always been writing, writing, and writing. And then I seen um, a question in the chat. I just wanted to address it real quick. So Michelle Cooley, she asks about what is. Oh, wait, uh, D. Reigns, give, give me just one second, because we're going to get her question. Okay. I was going to ask a part of my last question. Like, OK, cool. OK. I... Bet. All right. Yeah. So it's just it was just I writing. Got, I got personally. you. <laughs> so um, Shauna, um, um, Ryan, if you guys want to hop on um, to answer that question, please feel free. Um, if not, I'll sing into the final question. Um, yeah, um, I'd like to answer that question. Um, so, um, how foster care um, affected me and changing generational cycles. Um, I don't know, I just, I try to be kind to everyone I meet, um, whether that be a cashier or if I'm in the position of the cashier and there's a customer. I always say thank you, have a good day. And they could be like the grumpiest at me ever, but it could be their last day or they could be having the hardest day in the world. Like, I never know. Like, um, I just, I try to, I don't know. I, I'm trying to, I try to be a positive person even when people aren't positive to me. Um, because like kindness can really like just show up in people's lives like so beautifully like you don't know who needed that kindness and when or where they like have been and I just know like I've always wanted to be treated kind my whole life because of the things I've gone through and I don't know I just live that day to day by like that saying kill them with kindness is kind of cheesy but it's it's true because you can brighten someone's smile up so quick I just I want to keep continuing doing that and um so I like advocate for foster youth because I know I've been there and I want to be able to be there for other people um, because I know someone wasn't always there for me, so. Thank you, thank you. And you're doing such a great job. Um, and like I always say, we are always excited to have you um, be a panelist. And I love when I see your name in our writing queue um, because you really write really well and you know, black and so thank you thank you so much um ryan did you want to answer that question i did um okay. i promise i'll be quick um, okay. um in relation i'm sorry i still don't know all of you all's names i know miss shana who just spoke but like the first lady who you spoke um breaking generational curses damn right on that like this is my first trip out of the country no one in my family has been or no one related to me by blood has been out of the country as far as I'm aware of other than my grandma and she's old and bitter and I don't want to turn out like her um like Miss Shauna said kindness yes that is so important to other people but being learning how to be kind to yourself is so hard but it makes being kind to other people it's incredible Panama is amazing uh, but learning how to be kind to yourself first makes it a whole lot easier to be kind to other people when they're mean or spiteful because you become you begin to recognize that you're only mean or spiteful when someone says something that like pulls at like your little thorns, right? There's a thorn that's about abandonment and someone says something that you don't like and you may react out of anger, but you recognize that it's not directed at them. It's like, ouch, that hurt kind of thing, you know? So you begin to realize that other people, we're all just doing the same thing. We're, we're reacting negatively to our wounds because a lot of us, we don't recognize that we're hurting. We don't recognize that those thorns are pushing out of our skin and making us hurt the people around us. So like when Mr. D, Mr. Musician, man, <laughs> when he talks about going to therapy and writing, like even if it's nothing productive, like just taking a pen 
when you're angry, when you're sad and just letting whatever's in your head like flow through your fingers, like it's an easy way to recognize when those storms are poking out and maybe not take them away, but like, you know, build a nice little cotton or like a flower field around them. So it's just like, whatever you say, it can't hurt me because I'm tending to my garden, you know, kind of thing. But yeah, that's how I've learned to navigate my adulthood, how I got here, you know, through my foster care experience, because it's just like all of those things I had to learn how to do. And now I'm here. <laughs> yes, yes. I want to be like you. I want to be in Panama right now. I do. But no, real talk. Um, you know, just you're, you're such a beautiful woman and just keep doing the great things that you are doing and just keep using your voice. Um, you know, keep advocating for and breaking those trend, those generational curses. Um, you know, even just like, as I said before, as a mom now, um, you know, I find myself, you know, having to unlearn, you know, behaviors and unlearn trauma so that I don't pass it on to my daughter. And, and, and because she is a daughter, a girl, um, you know, I find it very, 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 very um, important, you know, to just make sure that she understands how to uh, communicate and express herself and her emotions. And I allow that space and I welcome it, you know, because that wasn't offered to me. And, at, you know, before I emancipated out the system, I just acted out in violence. It was just like, nobody could say nothing to me. It was just like, you know, just up. So um, my last question to everyone, um, and uh, Michelle, I wanted to thank you so much because I seen your question in the chat and we definitely wanted to make sure that we got to it, um, but I knew that it correlated with um, this last question. And so, um, you know, what advice will do you guys have for first and formerly um, current and former foster youth who have shared this similar experience, um, you know, rather than being in foster care because their parents were incarcerated, having incarcerated parents, and then being placed in foster care, um, what is your advice for the foster youth um, that have experienced that, and you know, and ways that you know they could, you know, survive um, out of that? I, and I hate that word. Um, and then, what is some advice that you have for the advocates, the people in the community, the social workers, that the foster parents and adopted parents that actually care and not doing it for the, for the profitable um you know gang but they actually are doing it because they love the foster youth they care about our development they want to love us and give us that space um and rebuild that trust and you know recreate that safe space for us um and so uh ryan i want to pass it to you since uh, you haven't had the opportunity to start first <laughs> thank you um i want to say to the caregivers or like the people involved the adults involved right um when you lead with love you leave with love right so if your intentions are pure if your intentions are truly to be of assistance to these youth to these young adults to these adults right you we don't need an explanation of like what your intentions are if they are that way we will feel it we will see it we have i feel like foster youth have had to become their own sort of impact right we can tell intention which is why mr d didn't get unpacked because he knew the people were full of shit yeah, you can get comfortable. No, you can't, because it's all a lie, it's a false. Your intentions are not true, we can tell. So if it's not up to par, you need to sit down and think about why you're actually doing this and if you need to continue on this path, because no matter what you say, no matter who you talk to, if your intention is not to be of assistance, we're gonna know and we're not gonna be receptive of your help, your advice or anything like that. To us, to other me's, <laughs> to other you's, it's really hard, right? We all know it's really hard. We all know we've gone through a trauma dump and a half that we didn't ask for, right? But knowing the fact, like some people did not get to make it this far also. Some people had to like just let go because this is out of our control. But the fact that we've made it to this conference at least, right? The fact that we've made it means that you have some, you have some kind of purpose in this story, right? You are an inspiration. And if you're not an inspiration, be an inspiration to yourself, shit. Like, I'm, I'm 20 years old. I would have never imagined I would be in a different country. I live a lot like, <laughs> I don't want to be like bragging, but I want you to see like, this comes from the power of believing in yourself. You are so fucking powerful. Like the fact that you are here, you are powerful. And I want you to like, I don't want this, oh, this hippie lady. So it's like, no, please believe that. Because once you do, oh my God, the amazing things you'll get to do for yourself. Forget what everyone else thinks. Like, oh my God, please. <laughs> I hope, I think you get the point, but like, yeah. 
Thank you, Ryan. Thank you so much. Yes, yes, to everything that you said. Action speaks. Yes. Um, and so you guys are all free to answer the question. Just unmute yourself and chime in. Um, we have about 10 more minutes left and I have to um, two more things that I want to get to before then. So you guys feel free to jump in um, and unmute yourself. Um, I made a I made a post a few years ago back when I was on Facebook and it says something to the effect of the um, all of the foster children that I know that I kind of grew up with. Um, I'm still kind of keeping contact with them periodically. They're some of the most resilient strongest out driven and loving people that I've ever met don't let your current circumstance take that from you embrace everything that you're going through because it's purposeful everything is purposeful I was ashamed of being a foster youth every time I would go to another foster home I would say that I was with a different family member and People can tell when you're full of shit. People can tell when you're lying. Even as children, they like, the girls would be like, well, why don't nobody look like you then? I'd be like, uh, we got different daddies. Like, it would be like <laughs> just so much. Like, embrace your situation and stand firm on it. Know that everything that you're going through is, is intentional. Like, and there is a, always a ceiling to be broken and something that you can grow from. Anything you go through, you should be able to grow through and it can help and inspire other people around you. And I do not want to sound cliche, but it is the absolute truth. Embrace your situation. Take advantage of the, um, the outlets, the people, the therapists, the, the, um, the funding that is given. Like Take advantage of that stuff. Um, and, and most importantly, take advantage of the, of the therapy. If you find a good counselor and a good therapist, you take advantage of it because without that strong mind and that strong foundation, anything else that you put in that gets put in front of you, that can be a, a potential opportunity, you yourself will destroy and self-sabotage. So you have to take advantage of the, the, the therapy because we all have traumas that we have been through. Like, I don't know no person that's in the foster system by way of having great adults in their life that are multimillionaires and take good care of them. Like, no, everybody is going through something. And in terms of the, the foster youth advocates, listen, listen to those children. F with that paper says, we know everybody got a file. Somebody then wrote something that could be, you know, deemed as potentially negative and they plant these seeds in our subconscious mind about this individual that we read on before we even seen. F that paper, listen to the individual, talk to that child, see what they're going through. If they complaining about a, 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 a foster parent or a, a teacher or anything, if they're, if they're acting out, those are all ways of communicating what's transpiring inside of somebody. Like, listen to them. Don't take it for granted. Don't, 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 don't let that be as a, a something like, oh, this person is just confirming what I already read about anyway. Like really listen to this person. Cause like I said, my first introduction was to juvenile hall is because I was being like, some of the panelists and speaking out and being an advocate for my situation and talking to the talking to the to, to the social worker and next thing you know seven day notice getting put in and there's nowhere to place me so I'm sitting in a juvenile hall for three freaking months like nah just listen listen to the children like if it's really about the children let it be throughout the, about the children through the highs and the lows like seriously because like the, it seems like, you know, when I was going through my situation and I don't want to be too long winded, I know we got more questions, but it seems like, you know, ultimately I landed in prison and I felt like everything that I went through throughout my youth was kind of preparing me for that. You know, like I missed holidays with my, with my family members and it got to the point where I didn't care about holidays. So when I went to prison, I did not care about, everybody was sad about it being Christmas I did not care. Like I was like, oh shit, y'all, y'all just now missing Christmases. I've been missing Christmases since I was seven. Like, I, like who cares? Like, like, no, listen to them. Like, no more 
shine like like shrugging it off like no more none of that just truly listen to the children and and don't take it just with a grain of salt like they, they they're going through something and they probably didn't been through more things than you have and they're probably half your age and they just don't know how to verbally express it yes 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 thank you so much for that perspective i'm over here in the back like woo. Laura, I low-key have to go off the camera because I was feeling like I was getting emotional. <laughs> for real, for real, it's like, um, you know, I have these conversations and these platforms, but nonetheless, you know, like, because I am a foster youth, a lot of this stuff is triggering, you know? And sometimes I'll be having to dial back because I'll be forgetting, like, you know, about some of my experiences. And then when I hear you talk about some of your experience, it take me back to a time when it was like, Lord Jesus, my social workers really wasn't protecting me. And I literally only had one good social worker in my whole life. Her name was Jean Torres out of LA County. And I always shout her out because she literally just advocated for me and just told me to just go for the win. And despite that foul that she had that you speak of, that, you know, puts this character, um, you know, and assassinates our character before we even get to the home. People already have ideas of who they think we are and, um, you know, what they think we're gonna be and who they think we want to be, um, you know, and and you spoke about the signs of communication, um, you know, and recognizing, you know, when a child was acting out that something else was happening. And, you know, these are all things that are not like literally, like, I, I don't feel like that, you know, the edu like it, it, it takes a lot to become a social worker, but you know, it, it, it takes a, a lot to connect with the youth and meet them and, and, and get right there into the same level. And so um, I wish a lot of foster youth would become more foster youth would be interested in becoming social workers. But, you know, when I was emancipating out of um, the, the system, school wasn't going to college and becoming something better than yourself wasn't, you know, something that was pushed. Um, you know, they wasn't worried about me, you know, and my goals and aspirations and the fact that, you know, this is not what I wanted or saw for myself, you know, and so, um, you, oh, you touched, the, so, like, I really have to hop off camera because I had felt like I was getting emotion, like, you know, I was feeling myself getting emotional and I had to dial back. And just so thank you so much for sharing our perspective because it's very, very important. Um, Ariel um, and Shauna, um, I definitely want to allow you guys to answer the question, but we have three more minutes. So if you can just chime in and be very brief um, and so that I can get to our last two slides before we thank um, everyone for attending. I greatly appreciate it. Yes, I'll be really fast. Um, this is more so for the foster youth advocates. I feel like it's really important for a foster youth advocate, whether you're a CASA mentor or what type of advocate position that you're in, that you really compile programs and like programs. I was in a program called Highway to Work. I'm from the Bay Area. That was instrumental. They like they basically pay you to go to workshops. There's like oh, workshops, like you need to like get those together for foster youth and let them know that they can go to college cost free. And if they apply for scholarships, that can help them with cost of living. So they do not have to work while going to school as possible for foster youth to get a degree in California and not have to have any student loan debt and financial literacy. Because what happens is trauma can come out in forms of financial, like poor financial decisions that can have lifelong effects on foster youth. So really compile the resources for them so they, so they can have a plan and start at 14 because high school goes by so fast. Okay. I just wanted to say, um, sometimes um, you like social workers, guardian ad litems, you guys are all a foster youth has sometimes. So like sometimes you are their anchor because sometimes, you know, sometimes you're all they have and they, you know, they look to you for decisions on, you know, what's gonna happen next. So just um, my advice would just always be kind and be patient because yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so um, I want to thank our panelists again. Um, this was a lovely conversation, and I really wish that I would have made. I wish I we can all just stay in, and we didn't have to work, and we can continue this conversation. Um, and it's definitely um, up in the air for consideration if you guys would like to do a part two to this, um, and then maybe we bring on like two social workers to you know talk about like you know how they advocate and you know or whatever. We'll figure it out, but um, definitely think that it this is definitely grounds for a part two conversation um, because this was a great discussion, and it's so 
much to unpack in such short time. Um, but I do definitely want to thank all of our audience members. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to Sarah that's in the background handling our um, technical um, and helping us with our support. Um, we really appreciate you guys. If you like what you saw today, if you're interested in you know being a panelist, if you want to see other topics, just please drop, um, uh, please fill out our um, survey that was dropped in the chat. Um, and here I actually can redrop it in the chat um, so that you guys can have it. And this just lets us know like how we did, how we can improve this event, how we can improve the next event. Um, on your uh, screen, you will see our next upcoming um, webinar, which we will be unpacking. Um, we will be speaking with single parents who were once foster youth and how they dealt with um, you know, that transition and transition into parenthood. Um, because I know that that's the anxiety that I faced, the fear. I didn't never thought that I was gonna be a mom. Um, and now that I am, um, you know, I want to um, create an open space so that other foster youth can share their experiences um, in hopes of, you know, being able to touch, um, you know, um, other youth. And then for National Foster Care Month, we will be um, hosting a um, webinar dedicated to um, maltreatment of foster youth, basically child abuse. I am seeking two LA County social workers um, that will come on and speak um, and share the stage with other um with panelists who have had lived experience to, you know, give and provide advice um, to other social workers on best practices to recognize abuse and not only in the home, but at the school, um, in the foster home as well. Um, and so if you're interested, please feel free to fill out this evaluation form that we have and put that you're interested in being a panelist um, for our National Foster Care Month webinar. Um, again, I would love to just thank everybody um, for being here today. You will receive a follow-up email with a recording um, with the slides. Um, I also will include our panel panelist information if you guys would like to get in contact with them. Um, if you have any foster youth that you feel would be um, interested in, um, you know, enduring to some of these wonderful opportunities that we have, whether it be being a panelist or participating in one of our um, paid writing opportunities, please feel free to send them over to me. Um, I'm also, um, you know, I'm, I've become a mentor. And so, I'm here, I'm here, whatever it is that you need, you have any questions. Um, and if you're interested in donating um, to the Youth Voice program, this helps us be able to pay our lovely panelists to keep our program active um, and for you able to be able to see, um, you know, great conversations and, um, you know, from live, li from panelists who have lived experiences, this helps us. So if you're interested in donating, if you love what you saw today, please feel free to um, click the link um, and, um, um, Click the link um, on the imprint news slash dot um, donate dot. I mean slash. Uh, ah, I don't know why did not just come out. Imprintnews.org slash donate, um, and make sure that you click the youth voice um, when you want to specialize where your donation is going to. Other than that, I want to sincerely thank my panelists again. Um, I can't say that enough. Um, you guys were beyond exceptional. I'm hoping that we can come back and do a part two um, and dive into some um, different questions and some other topics that, you know, there's so much to un unpack. Um, but you guys, this is literally why, like, this is why, this is why, and and I, and I always say, I, this is why, this this is the, the exact reason why I went to, through some of the things that I went through so that I can be able to come here I amplify my voice and help you guys empower, um, feel empowered and amplify your voice. And I hope that I did that for you guys today. And we look forward to having you um, at our, and seeing you at our next event. So thank you all again. And until next time.